We have an absolute treat for you today, ladies and gentlemen. John Myler, 144th Fighter Wing Chief of Cyber Operations for the U.S. Western Air Defense Sector, retired. He spent three years active duty in the Army, 25 years, 10 months in the Air National Guard, and he recently completed his career as the Chief of Cyber Operations for the 144th Fighter Wing. Now, today we discuss his research into the paranormal and the unexplained military encounters of giants, jinn, and possibly demonic entities, as well as the Antichrist and angel phenomena, revelation, end times prophecy. What an incredible show with an incredible person. John, you, sir, are a living legend. Thank you for this opportunity. Enjoy this presentation, ladies and gentlemen. Does that tie into, you wrote a book called The Strong Delusion, uh, revealing the God of the Antichrist. Is Strange there, God of the Antichrist, yeah. Is there a connection? Yeah, the, the uh, Bible says that the Antichrist, when he comes to power, he will have a strange God that his people doesn't know. And that book actually talks about um, the rise of radical end times, which I was predicting. The Antichrist, I believe, will come out of the country of either Lebanon or Inc or Syria. The uh, Bible actually predicts the location in the book of Daniel, and you could cross-reference it with uh, Revelation as well. Real quick, check out these statistics. Gold, it's gone up about 81% the past five years. The past 12 months, almost 20%. Central banks are ditching the U.S. dollar and U.S. treasuries and purchasing gold by the tons. Now, there's obviously never any guarantees, so you follow what the money funders are doing, what the MFers are doing. So what's the good news? Well, many predict gold is just getting started. The UBS even said it was going to go up to $5,000. Now, that's pretty awesome news, if you ask me. Noble Gold Investments, their phones are ringing off the hook. It appears that everybody wants to protect their retirement with gold and silver right now. You can do the same. Noble Gold Investments can help you secure some gold to protect your future. From day one, you will work with a dedicated all-American expert. Whether you're a beginner or an experienced investor, Noble Gold Investments will make sure you get all the help that you need. This month, Noble Gold Investments will give you a free one quarter ounce solid gold coin to add to your collection if you open up an account with Noble Gold Investments. Find out how to qualify. Their number is 1-877-646-5347. Go to leakprojectgold.com, get the free ebooks, let them know Rex from Leak Project sent you, and check out noblegoldinvestments.com. Now is a better time than ever to convert your 401 or IRA, unless it was last week or last month. Give them a call, you'll be glad you did. Now let's get back to the presentation. It tells you all these end times events, but it's not normal Islam that we know today. It is a new agey, updated version of Islam that includes extraterrestrial life. And this Jesus character, somebody who's gonna say he's Jesus, is going to like descend to earth in this public spectacle between the wings of two angels, which I think will probably be like two spaceships. The front of the, the, front of the book is like Jesus coming down between two spaceships and this massive people, right? And um, this otherworldly Jesus will be able to quote all these scriptures, you know, I am, I am, my kingdom is not of this earth, blah, 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 you know? Right, you know, see, see the spaceship up there on the upper right and then over on the left. This is in a, uh, in the Hadiths, it talks about how Jesus will come back to earth in the future. But the, yeah, that book, it covers that, but it also mentions the um, otherworldly influences in Islam. Um, it talks about, um, Muhammad, for example, when he was a little kid, was taken by an angel, and he did heart surgery on him. And it, they use his spiritual language talking about the, the procedure, but apparently some kids saw this happening, and they freaked out, and they ran and told their parents. And the parents came back ready to attack whoever was had their son, Muhammad, as a boy, and they found Muhammad perfectly fine, but he had stitches on his chest, it says. This is 6th century AD. I mean, they weren't doing heart surgery back then. But whatever happened to him physically opened up his chest, did heart surgery of some sort, and then closed him back up. It stitched him up. Um, 
And that's in the Quran. And so I, when I read that, I'm like, well, I've never heard this story about Muhammad being abducted <laughs> and having surgery by some other worldly being, but it's there. So I um, honestly think that there's all these other worldly influences. And then, of course, the jinn and are the same thing as the Nephilim. And, uh, and then they have a convergence of end times um, events. And uh, a lot of that book talks about things you can expect to see in the future. And uh, all of my book, you know, uh, Christian UFOlogy goes back to focusing more on the aliens and, and basically in the Bible and end times events. And as it's happening right now, unfolding before our eyes right now. Um, for example, I talk about, um, you know, um, what's happening with the Pentagon, the, the release of the Navy coming out with this information for all these years. You know, oh, it's a weather bloom. You know, um, now they're saying, no, it's not a weather balloon. We don't know what it is, but it could do circles around our F-22s like they're sitting still. And uh, Senator Marco, Marco Rubio said, I hope they're aliens, because if they're not, we're in big trouble. Um, and he has to be telling the truth, because if that kind of technology were in the hands of any other country, I don't think we'd be here as a nation. I think we would be owned um some speculate maybe we are owned and we don't even know it you know um as for the giant of kandahar that has a lot of documented evidence there's multiple people that were there talking about the same thing mm. and they had a black ops helicopter come in they bagged the body up they took it off somewhere nobody ever saw it again so they were interested in the body the properties of the dna and whatnot oh, yeah. um Super so soldiers, like things, real super soldiers they could possibly create in a lab with that. Oh, yeah. Thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think um, I did a lot of research on the bones of the Nephilim also. Um, I think the reason why we don't see these creatures in museums that at one time they probably were. Um, for example, the Golden Museum in uh, Lima, Peru. Back in the 90s when the internet, it was young. Um, I was searching for giants, information about giants, whatever I could find. And museums associated with the Smithsonian did not have these bones. And uh, there was a whole book written about this with a lot of research. Turns out you can find a lot of museums, especially here in the United States, where archaeologists kept meticulous notes on everything that they found in the digs. And they're talking about these giants. They're called the mound builders. They're all over the United States. Um, Almost every state, uh, they had these mound builders. Um, and these these archaeologists were pulling this stuff out. And then they were consolidating this stuff in the Smithsonian. But the Smithsonian had different reasons why they didn't want these things around. They didn't want people to know. Well, one version was that I read that they didn't want people to know that our Indians were primitive because of some sort of racist, racial things going on and they're like well if there's evidence of this advanced civilization but the indians yet were still primitive then that doesn't make sense that then then it's like almost like making them look stupid right and that they wouldn't be advanced why wouldn't they be advanced then so they just had problem with what they're finding in the archaeological evidence there's such a discrepancy with these findings and because they didn't fit with the narrative that was already pushed out they buried it and they would pack these giants away into these giant warehouses and stuff like that. Uh, that scene in um, Indiana Jones where he has the Ark of the Covenant, right? And you see the last scene. Oh, yeah, we have top scientists looking into it and they bury it in this warehouse. It's like unfathomably large, filled with who knows what. And you never hear or see anything about that again. They even had a TV series called Warehouse 13 based on the same idea. That's a real thing. Um, the Smithsonian has these massive warehouses where they just put stuff and you never hear about it again. And uh, apparently there's been whistleblowers that said that even at one point they took a lot of these giant bones and they took them out into the ocean on a massive barge and they dumped them in the ocean. And when I read that, I'm like, wait a second, why the heck would they do that? And then I came across this museum 
in Lima, Peru, and they actually had a picture on their website back in the 90s of this glass case and this skull, a human skull that was like three feet long or some crazy thing. This skull was huge. The body had to be over 10 feet tall, maybe 10 to 13 feet tall. Just huge. Um, and uh, they said that in this in this museum that they, they originally found two bodies. They believed that it was a king and a queen. They were buried in this ornate royal clothing. They had a sword and, and these gloves um, showing how big the hands were and everything. And um, they believed that there was a king and a queen and they may have been worshipped as gods and that they were like really tall. I think it was like 10 feet tall, something like that. And um, then after some time, then it was one body and then it got parred down and then it was just the skull of one of them. And that's all they had left in the museum. So why they kept, why they were like, you know, well, take this out and take that out. And now, now we'll just have a skull. Why would they do that? They didn't say that on their website, but they did actually Honey, have a picture. Maybe they were selling well, bits and pieces to, to stay afloat. You know, they're like, well, we're just uh, yeah, this I, time. I think maybe they were giving these things to um, early members of the World Economic Forum, possibly. Um, Klaus, uh, where anyway, are you? <laughs> anyways, uh, there was a skull there. Then I remember um, I w was updating the book. I was going to create a new edition 10 years later. I wanted to verify it, and I'm going through all the links. I went to the Golden Museum. They didn't have that picture on their website anymore, and I'm like, what the heck? You know, these were one of the few where you actually go to the museum because I was even planning to go there with uh, my pastor who had missionary friends in, in uh, Lima uh, in Peru. They were actually at a higher altitude driving distance from Lima. And um, so I contacted the curator of the museum and I asked about that skull and the guy's like, I don't know what you're talking about. We never had anything like that ever. And I just wish I would have done a screenshot to save that website back then because then I could have sent it to him. And he's like, no, I was a curator back then, too. And there, we never had it. There is a Wayback Machine, possibly, that might be able to get that. There's what's called the Wayback Machine. So if you can get the original link, you go to that, you might be able to pull that up. So that would be worth looking into for sure. Um, I don't know the, the details. The Wayback Machine, huh? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, the guy swore he never saw it. And then, so this got me to researching bones in general. Like, why would they get rid of it? And the Bible has different accounts of bones. Like, and it was something that I'd come across in my paranormal research also, that there's something about bones that seems to hold some sort of residual energy of the being that's used to inhabit the bones. Um, there's an account where there were some people with a dead body. They were taking it to a cemetery, and they accidentally dropped the body, and it rolled into the tomb of Elijah, the Old Testament prophet Elijah. When the dead body touched his bones, he was resurrected from the dead. So Elijah the prophet still had so much glory of God in his bones that when his dead bones touched a dead person, he was resurrected from the dead. There's that account. And then there's also other accounts of the bones and how the ancient Hebrews were like really insistent, you know, like, like when Jacob died, they made a point to maintain his bones and carry them back to the promised land when they came back to the promised land from Egypt. They didn't want to leave his bones in Egypt. And they buried him with his ancestors, with his bones. Um, and then I also, even in the Quran and the, the Hadith, they talk about the importance of bones and that these these um, these jinn, which I believe are also Nephilim, it's just another word for Nephilim, that they like the bones. And that uh, Muhammad and his people would sometimes, when they ate food and then there was bones left over, they would leave them out for the jinn. They would make a point not to use them to wipe when they go to the bathroom. <laughs> he actually literally says that because they would commonly use bones to to wipe their butt. Um, but he said, no, 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 we want to give these to the gin, you know, and, uh, so that they have something to, to gnaw on, I guess. Um, so they, in some instances, they treat them like physical beings. In other instances, they treat them like these trans 
trans-dimensional type beings, like they're sort of like ghosts or they're sort of here, sort of not, you know. And uh, that's another property about them that kind of aligns them with with Nephilim because Nephilim, um, they can actually die physically and then they become demons and then the demons are capable of, pol of poltergeist activity. But then they can also be actually living Nephilim but they have, they're not entirely native to this dimension or they're able to pop in and out of this dimension. So they're sort of ghost-like, you know, difficult to put your finger on whether they're physical or not. Um, and the Nephilim are kind of like that as well. The, you know, the Bigfoot, like um, got a crazy Bigfoot story of a, a personal friend of mine that encountered one that um, him and his friends were trying to hunt it when he was a little, when he was a kid. They had their rifles out and they were on a hunting trip. And this thing was literally right around them. They could hear it walking around. They could smell it. And they were like, how can we not see this thing? Um, it raided their camp food supply, grabbed cans of beans and just ripped them in half and ate the contents of the beans. And uh, But yeah, these things are like sort of physical, for, sort of not. And um, anyway, when they die, their bones, I'm speculating if a prophet of God has God's glory in him and his bones can still contain that residual energy, what if demons are the same way, but in a bad way? What if they have this demonic energy that's in their bones? And I have always wondered, there are places, I watch a show called The Dead Files and different shows like that, and it seems like there's some places that are just bad. And it dates back to the Indians saying, you know, we don't go to that valley. It's it's you, it's bad. Just don't. Don't go there. And, of course, we in the Western world, we're like, ah, yeah, it's just fooey. You know, we're going to go build a whole housing complex on top of that thing, you know. And then people have all these problems, right? And then they send these mediums in there and whatnot. And they're like, oh, this place is just bad. Like, just cut your losses, let go of your house, leave. Um, I bet you that if you were to do some archaeological digging, you might end up finding some Nephilim bones in those areas. And the beings are kind of still, they can have like a range of influence in a particular uh, distance. They can go like only so far from those bones to still have their abilities to do what they can do. Uh, but they're they still have their energy trapped in these bones, and they're still there physically. And I, that's a theory of mine. And if these bones, in fact, still have this residual energy, what would happen if you had a place where you were stockpiling these bones? It would probably be really bad. Um, so what if these museums and the the workers in these museums, as soon every time they brought in a giant, you know, oh crap. Crap, crap, we got another one of these. That means I'm going to start having nightmares. That means I'm going to start puking and getting sick, getting nauseated, getting headaches, getting cancer, getting this, getting that. Whenever I just go anywhere near that, I get sick as a dog. And I have these nightmares, poltergeist activity off the charts, you know, all kind of crazy stuff happening in the museum. And these bones are just trouble. And if you're a curator and you're dealing with stuff like that, you're not going to want to tell the public about it. You're not going to want to be all open and say, yeah, you know, um, instead you just kind of want to quietly make it disappear. And that's exactly what happened in the Lima Peru situation. Cause the guy did not even want to talk about it. He just denied that they ever had it there. And I knew that they had it there. I read it in a book that they had it there. And then I saw the website. I saw the picture of it. It was undeniable. They had a giant there. They started with two giants, and it was down to one giant, and then it was down to his skull, and then there's nothing. And, like, why would they deny it? I, honestly, you would think, gosh, this is a remarkable finding. You know, a 10-foot-tall human being, nobody's ever saw this before, and the Bible talks about these. And I actually found one. Think of the business that I could drum up for my for my museum or whatever, that I could just get people from all over the world to come here and marvel after this thing. You would think they would want something like that, but no, they do everything they can to quietly get rid of it. And 
One theory is that they sell them to very wealthy people who want them for like satanic rituals. Um, but what if it's both? What if, man, I want to just get rid of these things. Uh, let's just dump them in the ocean as far away from humanity as we can possibly get it. Uh, who knows? Maybe they dumped them where the uh, Bermuda Triangle is. <laughs> and that's why so many people die there. I don't know. But uh, they, they just get rid of them. But then, you know, you got these other curators that come along and they say, oh, man, I heard you dumped a lot of stuff in the ocean out there. Sure, save us a lot of trouble if you just uh, let us know the next time you find one of those. And we will take it off your hands for a handsome fee. Uh, I mean, we'll pay you good money for those if you find one. And so they may have been stockpiling it and then maybe making artifacts or something, you know, like grind the bones into some consolidated object, you know, and that'll be their object of worship or something. And, you know, who knows what they're doing, but I think that that's what's happening with these bones. And that's why. That's, that's intense, man. What's the truth? Where exactly is the truth? How far into that conspiracy do you want to go? Um, I, I honestly, and then, of course, the Dr. Stephen Greer, I kind of follow some of the stuff that he says. Um, we do have anti-gravity technology. We do have a lot of this otherworldly technology, but they have it closed off like very wealthy people that own corporations and stuff are controlling it. Um, the whole process of patenting was created to prevent inventions from, you know, getting published and used. Uh, I think that we discovered anti-gravity multiple times, uh, and it was suppressed each time. But what are they doing with this technology? It's because it's it is dangerous. If you understand gravity, you probably understand how to create wormholes. You understand the propulsion of these spaceships, these interdimensional intergalactic spaceships that are coming in and out. You, if you could punch a, a hole open in time space and travel to to other galaxies and other dimensions and stuff. Um, then you could probably create a weapon that could wipe out the planet in the blink of an eye. Um, so do you want that just being out in the public eye? Um, and because of that relative connection, that's probably why they suppress that kind of technology. Um, Stephen Greer is trying to push for other types of technology like free energy, which Tesla most likely figured that out. And then our government swooped in and grabbed all of his stuff and just gone. Um, but according to him, that they have this device that's like you could hold in your hand and stick it where your uh, junction box is to the power grid and cut off your power grid and your house would be supplied indefinitely with energy. Um, would run your whole house and everything in it. You'd never pay an electric bill. There's no reason why we can't have one of these in all of our houses and not need electricity anymore and get rid of all these power lines and stuff. Done. You know? Um and of course, Tesla talked about how you could transmit energy through the air or the earth and not need power lines to distribute your energy. And they didn't want that technology out there. So there's all kinds of technology we have that is being suppressed. Um, and then, you know, hopefully that that'll come out. Some of that will come out in the future, most likely, uh, especially when the Antichrist rises to power. The... Uh, the Bible talks about otherworldly technology, or, and it also, in the book of Daniel, in the end, chapter 12, it says that there will be an increase of knowledge, and there will be an increase of travel. People will be able to go all over the place really quick. Um, we're seeing that now. And uh, all of these prophecies are all over the Bible, and then they are, they're talking about all this stuff coming up in the future, and it's all headed toward one, one direction. And uh, because I'm looking at the Bible when I'm seeing all of these things and studying extraterrestrials and stuff, I'm seeing other things that a lot of the ancient astronaut community is not seeing. For example, the bio, they all speculate different reasons why they like to do genetic experimentation on us. Um, these alien abductions are always kind of like they follow families, which is an indication that they're tracking genetic manipulation. And they like to say, oh, well, they're, you know, preparing us for the age of Aquarius and and uh, transhumanism. And, you know, Bill Gates is a big advocate of that kind of stuff. These really creepy people 
uh, are really into that. Um, genetic manipulation, some speculate the mRNA is kind of a step in that direction as well. And uh, the ETs are also messing around with this stuff. So why? Um, well, you go back to Genesis, when Adam and Eve first sinned, and God showed up and he busted them, then he got them and that serpent there, and he pronounced a prophecy. And he said, the seed of the woman will overcome the seed of the serpent. He will stomp on the serpent's head, but the serpent will bite his heel. So he's talking about Jesus, who is the seed of the woman, because Eve had children and they had children and children and 77 generations later or something like that um jesus is born that's the seed of the woman god put himself in her so it's god's seed also but it's the seed of the woman will overcome the seed of the serpent so if they have an actual biological seed for the woman why wouldn't it be a biological seed for the serpent as well if if the fallen angels were having children biological children with humans why wouldn't satan have one as well and i think that he didn't originally he convinced the others to do it because he knew that that was a line that you couldn't cross and that if you did that that you would be thrown down into the dark regions of the earth where you know tartarus in chains that's what happened to them but satan interestingly didn't get thrown down in there and i think that that's because he used that as his trump card like maybe one of these days i'm going to have a kid but not yet. For now, I'm going to get rid of the competition. I'm going to convince all these other people that this is the thing to do. And then I'm going to kind of stand back and see what happens and watch them be judged. And they're stupid for listening to me. You know, he's a master manipulator. And these fallen angels were all captured and apprehended and thrown down into murder success. And you think it talks about it in the book of Jude as well. Uh, but Satan is the prince of the power of the air. So he is still, he's captive. He's bound to this planet because this was his original domain. But he's not able to leave it anymore. When he fell from glory, he was no longer allowed to walk amidst the stones of fire. That's what it's mentioned in Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel 28. So that's one of the scriptures where it talks about Satan's ancient kingdom and he led his rebellion against God and that he was a glorified, powerful being. Lucifer walked amidst the stones of fire. And I said, that's probably because the, the stones of fire are solar systems. They're not just rocks in a garden path, you know? What about his, what about stars? I Well, that's what a sun is. Yeah. Stone right. of fire is a star. And he's talking about walking amidst the stones of fire. Is his kingdom, his ability to traverse the vastness of the cosmos where his kingdom is stretched out. And it says when he fell from glory, he was no longer allowed to walk amidst the stones of fire. So he's restricted to this planet. Now, those beings could come here probably, and he still has connections, but he can't go out there anymore. He's, he's bound here. And then also, if you keep that in mind, these stones of fire and, and his ability to go out and everything, now... He's restricted to this earth, so he's he's going to make sure that he is going to try to bring his plan of rebellion, you know, through humanity against God. So God came through humanity to counter him on this planet. Um, and he defeated him on the cross. But the battle that's going to happen in the future, is, you know. We talk about the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, that's the Valley of Megiddo. And uh, so there's going to be this confrontation in the future against Jesus coming back. And the strong delusion is a phrase that's taken directly out of uh, 2 Thessalonians. And it says, "For because people just keep turning away from God in mass in so much, so much large numbers, God is not going to, not going to force them to believe in him. Instead, he's like looking at our hearts and he wants to see what we want. What do we want? What do we care about? What do we hope for? That's what God's search is. And uh, he created this for this design reason. Um, 
He wants us to look for him, to want to know him, to seek him out, not to make him in our own image, not to force him to conform to what we want, uh, but rather to find him and to try to find our purpose by finding him. Like, why did you make us? What is the point? You know, we want to know what you have to say. We're not going to put words in your mouth. And he wants to know what kind of stuff is in our heart. Like, what do we hope for? Like, do we hope for love? Do we hope for a God who loves us, who cares about us? You know, that there's a point. Somebody who wants us to be happy. Somebody who wants us to have a future. Um, rather than somebody who's even selfish or absorbed, self-absorbed or indifferent. Could care less if we pay any attention to him or not. Um, so being that God is love and that he created us with free will to seek him out, uh, if we do that, then good. But if we don't, then we're going to spread corruption and stuff, and we're going to screw up his creation everywhere we go. So he's confined it to this planet, and then he's allowing the devil to come in with this strong delusion in the end times to take anybody he, you know, to offer the best alternative to God. If you don't want a God who loves you and cares about you, and it's created heaven and a place for you, then here's every other alternative you can imagine. He's going to represent it, and he'll be God, Satan's capstone achievement in that. And Satan has held off on that, having a biological seed until the end times, and that's what all this genetic engineering is about. He's trying to pull out the best attributes of everything that humanity has so he could genetically engineer a perfect human angel hybrid. And his child will be a god in his mind. And he'll be a like, you know, trying to become Jesus, right? He'll he'll create his version of Jesus, a perfect humanoid. Jesus, even in, in the Bible, it says that Jesus wasn't even an attractive guy. He was just this average looking dude. Um that would not be Satan's. No, he wouldn't want to go there. Um, God is humble. Uh, Satan is definitely not humble. And uh, he will be this very egomaniac, ridiculous, over the top person, extremely charismatic, uh, very entertaining, very funny, very natural, outgoing. Um, Extremely handsome dude. Uh, he will be everything that the world says. Man, that dude is awesome. Um, and he will have a way of twisting things around that will make people just think. Uh, eventually, he will have them in the palm of his hand. And he will be able to talk to people and convince anybody of anything. Um, this is the, the genetic engineering. This is behind that, though. Um, reaching this goal of creating his global avatar, I think that's the reason why we're having all this genetic engineering. And I don't think that I've heard of that from any of these ancient astronaut people theorizing why why are these ETs messing around with our DNA so much? What you know, why would they be interested in us? And I've heard other people talk, you know, say, oh, it's because we have something in our DNA that they want. We're a very valuable species that way. And uh, different theories like that and such. And that could be the case. I mean, Jesus did create humans so that he could become a human himself. Um, so he chose this species in which to inhabit the universe as the firstborn of all creation. So that's cool. And that's an honor for our species. But Satan's trying to do the same thing. He's trying to copycat him um, because that's what Satan does. Uh, he's a copycat. He can't do any original creating from scratch himself, and you know, but he can grab what God created and try to make some sort of bastardized version of it. Um, and everything he tries to do, he's trying to outdo God, and he's trying to perfect, make an ultimate perfection. But it's it's uh, blasphemy, you know. So that's the gist of it, and I could just uh, honestly, I could keep going and going and going, but. Um, you probably got to put a, a cap on this show at some point. Um, 
Well, John, let me let me say, yeah. man, this is this is fascinating, and it'd be great to have you back to talk about Christian ufology. I know that was published at the end of 2021. So, um, yeah, yeah, this is fantastic. And where do people find your work? Like, are you on YouTube? Okay, uh, yeah, uh, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, I also have my own website, uh, johnmyler.com. Uh, let me share this screen here real quick. So you see um, aliensinthebible.com, aliensandtheantichrist.com. These are older books. Um, Christian Ufology is the second edition to Aliens and the Antichrist. It's just got a different name. Probably a little more accurate in terms of what it depicts, even though this, this is talking about the Antichrist, definitely, and his, his uh, agenda as it relates to the ET phenomenon. Um, but I don't believe that all ETs are bad. I don't believe, you know, that the Bible says that there's faithful and fallen angels, right? And uh, I even talk about cosmic salvation, that if there's angels dealing with sin and death like humanity, that they probably come here to Earth to find out about Jesus. And um, and that there's, that you know, Revelation 14, that's an angel reminding everybody who God really is in the end times. And uh, this angel may be associated with otherworldly technology and actually showing up and suddenly baffling a lot of Christians. Like, what, is he an alien? Is he an angel? What is he? Um, so I talk about these kind of things in Christian ufology. It's on ChristianUFology.net. And then there's the StrongDelusion.net. And then these are landing pages on my website, JohnMyler.com. Uh, I do welcome emails, jmyler at yahoo.com. I I, um, I answer pretty much every email I get. And uh, if anybody wants a copy of any of these books for free, if you can't afford it or you're on the fence about it, um, I am totally okay with emailing you free copies. I do ask that you uh, give me a, a review on Amazon. Uh, but I will email anybody back with a copy, any book, by request. I will email you a free copy. That's pretty honorable. I appreciate that. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of emails, so be prepared. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I honestly hope so. I don't mind giving these books away. Um, I've been writing for 30 years now and um, kind of given up on trying to make any money at it. I've lost actually a lot of money, but uh, I consider it uh, an honor a privilege to you know that god would open my mind to show me different things in the bible that a lot of people haven't seen and um i'm also open to debate these things uh let's say there's some christians out there that are like i don't know if this guy's really a christian or not uh my on my website i put you know here's where i here's my statement of faith these are the things i believe in and i just pull right out of the evangelical statement of faith just as you know yeah i believe in all these things but I believe in a little more, you know, Jesus said, uh, he came, he was going to sheep for another fold. You know, he had sheep of another fold that he mentioned too. I think that, you know, most Christians say, well, yeah, that's the Gentiles. Like, sure. Yeah. It's the Gentiles and probably a lot more. Um, and I don't think Jesus had to go to all these other planets to die on those planets too. I, I do think that, that, you know, when he died on the cross, it applied to everything. I mean, and that there's even beings from other worlds that he had in mind to save them as well. Because sin spread throughout the cosmos. Colossians chapter 20 said that God is reconciling all things in heaven and on earth with him. And if you look at that, it's like, then that means that there's life in the heavens that needs reconciliation with God. It literally says that in the Bible. And, you know, that's why I had that section called Cosmic Salvation, and I talk about it because that is God's agenda. God's the creator. He's not an ET. Uh, he created us. He created all life. ETs are there in the Bible, too. Uh, God delegates to angels, and that's where people get a lot of confusion, you know? And like, like that cylinder that was following Israel around and feeding them for 40 years in the desert and work through Moses to split the Red Sea and all of that. Yes, it could have been technology, 
yes, that could have been angels right there with him, and God delegated them to do it. So scripture talks about God being part of all of that. He was, sure, I totally believe it. And I totally believe that he could have delegated to angels, and then angels use technology, and yet it's still God. So it's just a matter of perspective, and it doesn't have to be all or nothing like, no, if angels are in a picture, then that just totally messes up my mind, and I, I can't understand and be a Christian anymore because of that. Um, that's why I wrote these books, especially Christian ufologies, because I want Christians to know it is possible to understand life and the cosmos and still be a believer in the Bible and everything that the Bible says and be actually a Christian and not have to abandon my belief that God created humanity from the dust of the earth. I don't believe that. I believe God did create humanity from the dust of the earth, just like the Bible says. But the Bible says so many other things. And it does include the story of how much bigger everything is than what they've been thinking all this time. And we're about to see changes in the world here that are going to force them to understand scriptures in, in a different way that they've never looked at before. And that's why I wrote this, because I want to open the dialogue. I want to get people to thinking about it. You know, there's possibilities to interpret certain things in ways that you never really considered. And uh, we need to have this now, written now, and on the table now before things get crazier, because I think things are going to get crazier. Well, you got that right. So buckle up, Buttercup. It's going to be bumpy. And yeah, John, man, what an honor to speak with you. I'd really like to speak with you again sometime. And I hope that you continue your endeavors and keep being the change the world needs to see. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me on. Right on, man. Live, Live on long and prosper. <laughs> Cheers. All right. Bye-bye. Wow, John's got some cool stories to tell. Thank you, John, very much for your service. Thank you for being awesome, and thank you for this presentation. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching this presentation. Check us out over on Patreon. This is almost two and a half hours on Patreon. A lot of information we talked about only available there. Plus, I have hundreds of hours of exclusive content on our Patreon page, as well as leakproject.com, long format interviews, amazing guests, amazing topics, and hit the bell for all notifications here on our YouTube channel. Check back daily for new notifications, new content. Sometimes people don't get the, uh, the notifications for whatever reason. So just make it a part of your daily routine to check us out here on the YouTube channel. And I'll see you over on Patreon, everybody. Have a beautiful day. Be well. Hit the bell. And be the change the world needs to see. It starts with you. You're awesome. Nanny, nanny. <laughs>